Hey everyone, my name is Nicole Rizzuto and I am the program manager at the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights and Genocide Education, also known as CHANGE. We are located in Lincroft, New Jersey, and we've created this virtual Lunch and Learn series in order to stay connected with our community during this difficult time. This is the third discussion in a series of Lunch and Learns. Our first two Lunch and Learn discussions can be found on our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash C-H-H-A-N-G-E. There will also be a Lunch and Learn next Wednesday that I'll discuss further at the end of the presentation. Today we're going to be talking about the personal survivor history of Dr. Hachig Bogosian, who was a survivor of the Armenian Genocide. Change has been committed to educating about the Armenian Genocide since we were created in 1979, and we're able to create most of our programming through the help of local Armenian survivors and their descendants. I would like to especially thank Silva Bogosian Baker, her father Edward Bogosian, and the entire Bogosian family for their help in the research that we've created that we've used to create this program, and also for being a part of Hundred Year Legacy of Courage, our book about the Armenian genocide survivors that was published in 2015. I know that many of the people participating today are Bogosian family members, and I would like to say thank you to everyone for joining us. I'm very honored that we have Hachig's daughter, his last remaining child, with us today, as well as many of his grandchildren. It's so important that the Armenian community continue to continue to honor their descend their I'm sorry. It's so important that the Armenian community continue to tell the story of the Armenian genocide and explain what happened and how their families are connected to it. So thank you everyone for joining us. I do want to note that in the marketing for this program, we spelled Dr. Bogosian's last name with one S. After speaking with the family, we are going with two S's from here forward, including in this presentation and the scrapbook that will be sent out later. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. The chat is locked to everyone, so you are able to chat with the host, um, me or the other co-hosts who are staff members at Change. Um, but you will not be able to chat uh, with other participants until the end of the presentation. We ask that if you have any questions, you put them in the chat box as your audio will be muted for the entirety of the presentation. Also, this meeting will be locked at 1140 AM, meaning that if you leave the meeting, you will not be able to get in. So if you have to switch screens, feel free to do so, um, but you won't be able to leave the Zoom meeting and then return. I do want to note if you can't find your chat box, just toggle your arrow at either at the bottom of the screen or the top of the screen and you should see the word chat and you can type your questions in there. If you are unable to attend the whole meeting or if you know someone who was unable to get on before 1145, um, a recording of this video will be emailed out to all of the registrants. So you can always watch it again, um, use it for teaching purposes or share it with your friends. And it will also be available on our YouTube channel. Again, that's YouTube dot com backslash change BCC. Okay, so now let's get started on Dr. Hachik Bogosian's history. Hachik Bogosian was born on September 15th, 1875. He was the youngest of four children and the only son. He was very close to his sisters, um, and especially his oldest sister, Esther, who would be a driving force behind much of the decisions that he made in his life. From what we know about the family, they were very politically involved throughout the time of the 1870s through the beginning of the Armenian Genocide. Um, the family would have gone to local schools. They lived in Kayseri, which was a central province of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and they would have been surrounded by a large Armenian community. In the province of Kayseri, there were over 600,000 Armenians. And in the city proper where Hatchard was raised, there were 50,000 Armenians living in the 1870s. Hachig would have been close to, would have been in close proximity to his grandparents. Um, and he went to church each Sunday as a member of the Armenian apostolic community. We know that Hachig was close to his family because in 1884, when Hachig was only nine years old, his grandfather was murdered outside the family home. While we don't have the specifics regarding how or why his grandfather was murdered, we know that it was 
at the hands of a Turkish mob. And we believe that it was politically, uh, it was because of his political connections at the time. Armenian nationalism really began to rise in the 1870s. And the Turks were not happy about this rise in Armenian nationalism. So we'll see how that grows over the span of Hatchig's life. As I mentioned, Hatchig was born in Kayseri, and I want to take a moment to tell you a little bit about this province and um, the unique aspects of it within the Ottoman Empire, and also why it's important to know where Hatchig comes from. So Kayseri is a central province, and you can see it on the map here. Um, it's right under the word Turkey on that map. It's about 722 kilometers or about 350 miles from the capital, um, which is now Istanbul, but at the time of Hatshepsut's birth would have been known as Constantinople. Kayseri was famous throughout the Ottoman Empire and the rest of the world really, because of their Anatolian rugs, also known as Ottoman carpets. Um, these rugs have been famous for centuries and Armenian and Persian members of the Ottoman Empire were really valued for their weaving skills. If you're interested in see, seeing some of the amazing Armenian craftsmanship uh, throughout the 1870s through the 1920s, we do have plenty of Armenian lace work on display in our exhibit, Journeys Beyond Genocide, The Human Experience. And I invite all of you to join us and come for a tour once we reopen. As I mentioned, Kayseri was home to over 600,000 Armenians with 50,000 Armenians living in the city proper. Kayseri was also home to some of the wealthiest people living within the Ottoman Empire, many of whom had made their money um, from the Anatolian rugs or Ottoman carpet sales. Within Kayseri proper, the city, Armenians and Greek Orthodox citizens lived side by side and they often mixed culture, um, intermarriage was common, and you really have this strong Christian identity between the Armenians and the Greeks. However, Kayseri was a very multi-ethnic city um, and included Kurdish, Turkish, and Jewish members as well. At the time of Hatshepsut's birth in 1875, the Armenian apostolic population was so large that there would have been seven, that there were seven Armenian apostolic churches to serve the Armenian population. Some of these churches dated back hundreds of years. Um, and this was because Armenia, the Armenian people have recognized themselves as Christian since 300 CE. So these churches were hundreds of years old and they were standing for um, all of Kayseri to attend. Today, because of the Armenian genocide and other measures taken by the Turks after the genocide, the Armenian population of Kayseri has dwindled substantially. substantially. And now there is only one church available in the entire city of Kayseri. This church is the Church of St. Gregory the Illuminator, named for the man who is believed to have brought Christianity to the Armenian people. The church is so little attended that, the, that there is only one priest to service the church, and he only comes to Kayseri once a year on St. Gregory's feast day, which is September 30th. Life for Armenians changed drastically during Hatshik's childhood. When he was only two years old, Russia won the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 and quickly put into place measures that gave them more control over the eastern provinces where they hoped to establish an independent Serbian country. Um, many of you will know that the Serbians are also Christian and so the Armenians saw this as a step forward for relations between the Christian communities of the Ottoman Empire and the Ottoman Turks. Europe realized that if Russia gained more control of the Eastern provinces, um, Russia pow Russians, Russia's power would increase substantially. And afraid of this type of power within the Russian Empire, the European powers called the Congress of Berlin in 1878. This was a Congress in which the European powers, um, primarily France and Italy and England, worked together to create peace between the Ottoman Empire and Russia that would allow the Ottoman Empire to continue to act as a buffer between Russia and the West. The Armenian people sent representatives to this Congress. However, the European powers were afraid of upsetting the Ottoman representatives and so they wouldn't let the Armenians into the room. They did recognize the importance of giving protection to the Armenian population. Um, many of the Western powers in Europe had 
citizens who were deeply invested in what was happening to their Christian brethren within the Ottoman Empire. And there was pressure on the governments to do something to protect the Armenians. So in the Treaty of Berlin, which was signed in July of 1878, the Europeans and the Russians decided to create Article 61. Um, and this article, which you can read on your screen, says, quote, the sublime court engages to carry out without further delay the ameliorations and reforms which are called for by local needs in the provinces inhabited by Armenians and to guarantee their security against the Circassians and the Kurds. It will give information periodically of the measures taken for this purpose to the powers who will watch over the execution of them. So when Hatrig is three years old, Europe creates this treaty in which they demand that the sublime court, which is the seat of the federal government within the Ottoman Empire, make reforms that are going to benefit the Armenian populace. Um, these reforms include uh, more legal representation for the Armenians and less discrimination within um, you know, courtrooms and other legal dealings. Um, these reforms include tax reforms. Armenians and other Christians within the Ottoman Empire were also subje were often subjected to double taxation um, because of their religious differences from the majority Muslim Turks. And so these reforms were supposed to alleviate the double taxation. And finally, the reforms were supposed to increase Armenian representation within the Sultan's military. Um, many of, much of the violence per perpetrated against the Armenians was led by Turkish soldiers. And there was a hope that if the military was reformed and Armenians had more representation, that violence against the Armenians would stop. The British took the lead on really pushing for these reforms. Um, and they put pressure upon the Sultan, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, to pass these reforms. But he resisted both because he claimed they didn't have the money within the federal government to pass the reforms, and also because he was afraid of annoying the Pashas, who were the regional overlords who controlled different provinces across the empire. After witnessing his grandfather's brutal murder at the hand of a Turkish mob at the age of nine, Hatcha completed his primary schooling in Kayseri and then moved to the Gatronigan School um, in Constantinople. The Gatronigan Armenian High School was founded in 1886, and it's pictured here, um, and it's connected to St. Gregory the Illuminator Church. This is not the same St. Gregory the Illuminator Church that exists in Kayseri. Um, he was, this saint was a very popular saint within Armenia and he remains so today. Uh, so there are many churches named after St. Gregory throughout the Ottoman Empire um, servicing the Armenian population. The, church, the school is still around today and it still serves the Armenian community. Um, in the 1880s and 1890s, it was for young men only. Now it serves all genders um, and today it has over 100 students enrolled. Classes do take place in Turkish, but they do have Armenian language and literature courses at this school. While Hatchik was a student at the Gatronigan School, his family moved from Kayseri to Constantinople. Um, Hatchik graduated in the spring of 1895 at the age of 20, or I guess he would have been 19 because he turned 20 in September. And soon after his graduation, tragedy struck the family again. Hatchik and his father learned that a Turkish mob were coming to attack both of them for their political leanings. Um, Hatchik was 20 years old and his father encouraged him to hide. And so Hatchik hid in the attic of a nearby Turkish neighbor and he was able to escape the mob. His father was not as lucky and his father was brutally murdered by another Turkish mob um, right outside the family home in Constantinople. According to the Boghossian family, one of Hatchig's biggest regrets was that he was never able to avenge his father's death. Soon after the death, Hatchig was forced into prison for 25 days for his political beliefs. We don't know why he was arrested, but I can tell you that another Armenian genocide victim um, was actually arrested in the 1890s just for carrying a political song book. So just for having a book of songs, one of our other victims was arrested for a time. And so Hatchig could have had something as simple as a book of songs in his back pocket. 
After the arrest, he realized that he didn't have the money to provide for his family. He was the youngest child, yes, but he was the only boy, and it fell upon him to take care of his widowed mother and his three older sisters. Patrick knew he couldn't provide for all three sisters, and so he worked with German missionaries to send his two middle sisters to Germany, and that's actually where they rebuilt their lives. His oldest sister, Esther, sacrificed her own life to make sure that he succeeded. She never married, she took care of their mother, um, and she raised money to help Patrick go from Constantinople to Germany to begin his undergraduate studies um, in Europe. Patrick moved to Germany in 1897, and in 1899, as an undergraduate student, he visited his two sisters that were living in Germany. This was the last time he would see either of those sisters. We know that one of them died of a disease, most likely cancer, before the Armenian Genocide. Um, the second sister lost touch with the family during the Armenian Genocide, and we're not sure what happened to her. After completing his undergraduate studies in Germany, Hatschig moved to Switzerland where he attended the University of Lausanne and studied psychiatry. He graduated in 1901 from the University of Lausanne with a focus on typhoid fever and his background in typhoid fever would be instrumental in helping him rebuild his life during the genocide. While Hatschig was in Europe, life changed drastically for the Armenian population in the Ottoman Empire. Um, Sultan Abdul Hamid II tried to push reforms uh, in a very minuscule way, but was unable to find success in these, and his pashas fought back violently. The pashas within the Sassan Mountains were angry at the Armenian mili militia for rising up in a nationalist movement in 1893, and they sent Kurdish warlord warlords and Turkish soldiers to put down this Armenian rebellion. Um, this would be a constant pattern within the Ottoman and Armenian relationship for the next decade or so, in which a small um, nationalist movement would result, led by male militia members, would result in Kurdish and Turkish troops coming into the region and killing everyone, including civilian men, women, and children. The Sassoon massacres, as they came to be known, took place in the summer of 1893, and they were the first step towards what would later be known as the Hamidian massacres, in which over 100,000 Armenians, and many believe up to 300,000 Armenians, were killed between 1894 and 1896, um, and they were killed indiscriminately. After the um, Hamidian massacres took place, there was also increased taxation against the Armenian population as punishment for their nationalism and increased Kurdish violence led by Kurdish citizens of the Ottoman Empire because the military was now behind them and was no longer trying to stop the violence. Armenian nationalism would be used to justify massacres and the Armenian genocide um, throughout the next two decades. And in 1895, Europe was so horrified by how violent the Turkish response was that they created the Commission of Inquiry. The Commission of Inquiry interviewed 190 witnesses and survivors from the Sassoon massacres, trying to figure out exactly what had gone wrong in the Sassoon Mountains. The inquiry concluded that vast reforms had to take place across the Ottoman Empire. And while the Sultan had his own inquiry put in place for the Sassoon Mountains, he was pretty much unable to do anything because his empire was falling apart. The Young Turk Revolution began in July of 1908. And for the next few months, the Sultan was forced to fight against his own um, Turkish Muslim people and his own military as they tried to establish control and end his Sultanate. In April 1909, the Young Turk government took control of the federal government in the Ottoman state. Um, and they created a, they, they were hoping to create a new democratic government rooted in Ottomanism. The belief that people from across the empire, regardless of their ethnic and religious backgrounds, could come together peacefully. At the same time that the Young Turks took control of the central government, Kurdish and Turkish uh, civilians started attacking Armenians in the Adana province. The Young Turks knew that they had to put down this violence immediately and they sent Turkish troops to Adana to put down the Kurdish and Turkish attacks on the Armenians. 
When the Turkish soldiers got to Adana, however, they turned against the Armenians, accused them of, rebellion, of rebelling, and over the next few weeks, killed between 10,000 and 20,000 Armenians living in the Adana province. So this was almost half of the Armenian population living in Adana. Hatchik was kept abreast of what was going on in the Ottoman Empire with, through letters between himself and his mother and himself and his older sister, Esther. After graduating in 1901 with a doctorate of psychiatry from the University of Lausanne, pictured here, um, Hatchik opens up his own private practice in Switzerland. And within a few years, he meets and becomes engaged to a German woman. However, as the letters became more and more dire, Hatchig realized that he would not feel comfortable leaving his mother and his eldest sister alone in Constantinople. And so in 1914, Hatchig left the woman his granddaughter considers to be the love of his life, got on a train and went back to Constantinople. As many of you know, 1914 marks the beginning of World War I. And this was really a turning point in the Young Turk administration. Um, during the Balkan Wars, which took place from 1912 to 1914, they tried to create a military that was multi-ethnic and that spanned all religions within the empire. Having lost the Balkan Wars, they changed their tactics and uh, basically abandoned their Christian, their Christian citizens, focusing their attention on pleasing the Turks and the Kurds. Um, Hatchig arrived in the Ottoman, the Ottoman state at a time when there, were, there was increased tension between the Ottoman state, the government, and the Armenians. He gets a job immediately with the Armenian National Hospital, but he leaves that job pretty quickly because he has that previous arrest on his record, the 25 days that he spent in jail in 1895, and because his entire family had been politically involved, so he didn't want to draw attention to himself. Instead, he opens a private practice in Constantinople and begins to take control of the family household. In August 1914, at the start of World War I, the Ottoman state signed a treaty with Germany, agreeing to enter the war on the side of the Germans. However, they didn't actually begin any real fighting until late October of 1914, when the Russians attacked the Ottoman Empire. This led to conscription of almost every man within the empire, and Hatchig was actually encouraged to enlist. He was not conscripted by local Armenian religious officials. Um, Hatchig went to Sekurji Station, which is in Constantinople, and applied to work as a military doctor, and he was actually stationed there for a few months. Hatchig believed that he was an essential personnel at the Sekurji Station, and he thought that he would stay there for the duration of the war. However, after the Gallipoli campaign begins in February, when Allied troops begin attacking the Ottomans on their own soil, the Ottoman, Empire, the Ottoman state turns against its Armenian population, accusing them of working with the Russians and the Europeans um, to bring down the state from within. There's a lot of anti-Armenian sentiment for the next few months. And then on April 24th, 1915, Patrick finds himself as one of the 250 Armenian intellectuals who are rounded up and forced into prison. Patrick recounts this night in his memoir, and I'll read you a section of it now. Quote, after supper, I went to the house of my friend, Dr. Bebeyan Pasha, and we passed the time playing backgammon and piano. I left and came home at 1.30 a.m. and went to bed. Everything was calm, both inside and outside of the house. I had just lain down and was on the verge of falling asleep when the outside doorbell rang loudly three times. My sister Esther hurriedly went downstairs, opened the door, and after exchanging a few words, rushed upstairs and knocked on my door, telling me that the police wanted me." End quote. Hatchig recognized that his position within the Ottoman military would be helpful when meeting with the police officer. And so he dressed in his full uniform, which is pictured here, um, before he met with the three police officers who were there to arrest him that evening. Patrick was confused because he couldn't figure out why three officers were needed to take him to the commissioner at 1.30 in the morning. Um, but he followed the police officers. They brought him to a government building in the capital. Um, and then, pushed, then he was transferred again to a private prison within Constantinople where there were 50 other Armenian men waiting. 
No one really knew what was going on, um, but before Hachi could find out what was going on, he was transferred again. And this time he was brought to Central Prison, also in Constantinople, and forced to relinquish his uniform. The guards that were there actually wrote to his family and had them bring a change of clothes. And Hachid was forced to give up his entire uniform, including the sword that you see on his hip there. The next morning, after spending the night alone in an empty room with, uh, with at least a dozen beds that were there, um, Hachig found 50 other men had been brought to central prison. He spent about a week with these men, getting to know them, reconnecting with old friends from the Gachanigan school, and really trying to figure out why they had been arrested. At the end of the week, the men were forced to Hadar Pasha train station. There were about 35 men who were brought to the train station. The other 15 were seemingly let go, um, but we know that, they, that many were later rounded up again. From Haider Pasha, the group of men were split into two groups. One were sent to Ayash prison and one was sent to Chinkiri prison. Hachig originally went to Ayash prison and this was a um, warehouse in which the prisoners were kept inside two small rooms, um, no open air, no restrooms, and pretty much forced to stay there for weeks. At the end of about three weeks, Hatrick found out that he was scheduled to be transferred to Chankiri prison. And he had heard that Chankiri prison was open air. Um, and he also knew that he had friends that were there. So he was not upset about being transferred to Chankiri. However, on his train ride to Chankiri, he was rerouted and taken um, with only one armed guard to Kayseri, where he was told that he was going to stand court martial on trumped up charges about speaking out against the Turkish people. He arrived at the court martial and was accused of speaking out against Turkish intelligence while he was lecturing in Paris back in the uh, early, the late 1890s and early 1900s. The president of the court martial was a man by the name of Shevket, and he had the honorific of Bey, meaning that he was a military officer um, beneath a pasha, but of pretty high rank. Shevket had a wife who suffered from post-traumatic stress and he wanted Hachig to work with her to make her feel better and make her um, and basically bring her back to full health. Hachig would go each day to the Shevket's home and spend time with Mrs. Shevket, um, treating her for her post-traumatic stress. At the end of the month, Hachig had begun to see Shevket as a friend. They often had dinner together after Hachig spent the day with Mrs. Shevket. Um, and also, you know, after a month, he began to think that he was necessary to the Shevket family. He was helping Mrs. Shevket. He turned to Shevket and said, what is going to happen to me? Have they reached a verdict on whether or not I'm guilty? Am I ever going to be released? And Shevket pulled out a piece of paper that basically said that Hatchig was up for elimination. He was meant to be murdered whenever Shevket decided that Hatchig should die. Hatchig was terrified. He trusted this man and now this man was saying, I have orders to kill you. And so he pled with Shevket and he pleaded with Shevket and said, you know, I treated your wife for a month. This is no way to return my hospitality. Shevket agreed and he worked with a local pharmacist to set bail, uh, to put up bail for Hatchig. The pharmacist gave the money to the court martial and Hatchig was now a free man. This was in late July of 1915. Hatchig went to the Angora uh, province, now called Ankara, and he stayed with a female relative named Haganoush. He thought he was safe here because the area in which he was living was heavily Armenian Catholic, um, meaning that they were not Armenian apostolic and were probably under less threat from the government. The Armenian Catholics saw themselves as separate from Armenian people. They had split from the Armenian Apostolic Church 100 years before 1915 and didn't really connect with the Armenian culture anymore. However, a few days after Hachig arrived, he received note from Shevket saying, you need to stay inside tonight. There's going to be another roundup. Hachig was not rounded up that first night, but he was rounded up a few days later, along with Haganesh and her entire family, and about 820 other Armenians living in the Angora region. Many of these 820 Armenians did not, again, consider themselves Armenian. They were Catholic and they kept telling this to their, their Turkish um, guards, but the Turks ignored them. 
and forced them to march for 18 hours. During this 18 hour march, the Turks had the Armenian people tied with ropes in groups of four so that the ropes bound their, hand, their wrists and ankles together, preventing escape. Also during those 18 hours, the Turks killed about 25 people of that caravan, seemingly without any provocation and at random. After they marched for 18 hours, the 800 remaining um, Armenians were forced into a Kurdish village, 50 people to each house, and told to wait. Hotchik recounts that there was this, this atmosphere of fear throughout the village. Um, everyone pretty much thought they were waiting to die. And so he uh, waited with everyone else until finally two soldiers arrived on horseback and said that everyone in the village was now their responsibility. Um, the soldiers had all of the Armenians untied and allowed them to go get food and water. And the Armenians believed that they were saved and that life was going to get better now. They looked forward to a better tomorrow. However, when tomorrow came, the two soldiers on horseback forced everyone to march again. And you can actually follow their voyage on the map uh, on this screen. You can see they went from Ankara, they traveled to Kayseri, then to Nide, and then from Nide to Tarsus. This journey lasted 43 days and over 350 miles, um, 607 kilometers, as you can tell from the map. During this voyage, 200 of the Armenian people who were marching alongside Hatchik died, many of them from starvation and disease, primarily dysentery. By the time Hatchik reached Tarsus, he too had dysentery, and he was taken in by a Kayseri family um, who was living in a tent city where he could heal after a few days from his dysentery. While in Tarsus, Hatchik decided he wasn't going to continue on the death march. He found the Krakian family, um, who he knew from Kayseri, and together they got a horse and carriage and took the horse and carriage to Aleppo. This was the first arm of his escape. He gets off the carriage in Aleppo and the fam he and the family are able to find a hotel room where they seek shelter for the night, thinking that they've finally escaped. However, the next morning, police officers come to their hotel room and drag them to the local, police, uh, the local train station where they're supposed to stay as prisoners until they can be moved. Hotchig finds out that the station is looking for doctors and he presents himself as a military doctor. He's told by the soldiers there that they've maxed out the quota for military doctors and he should return to the other prisoners. Desperate to, for his freedom, Hatchig ran. Thankfully, Hatchig knew someone who was living in Aleppo and he was able to find Dr. Collegian easily. Hatchig looked terrible. His clothes were all torn. He had no shoes. He had to actually steal sandals. Um, he was malnourished, he was just getting over dysentery, and he knew that he couldn't be outside for a long period of time. So he stopped into a local hospital and was able to find Dr. Collegian, who he had gone to school with and worked with at the Armenian National Hospital back in 1914. Dr. Collegian allowed Hatchik to stay with him for three months. And during those three months, he worked with the, mili with the military hospital and the national hospital in Aleppo to get Hatchik put on the epidemics commission. And this was primarily because, as I said earlier, Hatchik had that doctorate in typhoid fever studies. Um, Hatchik is able to get legal papers and legally find a home and work within Aleppo, where he does a lot of uh, work with the military hospital as well. While he's at the military hospital, he meets a man named Hagez Agap Kazazian, who is a fellow Armenian from Kayseri. And he works with other doctors there to convince the Turks that Mr. Kazazian has typhus. Um, he gets Kazazian transferred to the Aleppo hospital, the civilian hospital in Aleppo, hoping that Kazazian can escape from there. But in a weird turn of events, Kazazian actually comes down with typhus. Uh, he's treated by the doctors at the civilian hospital and then forced back to work um, as a slave laborer on a nearby farm. We do know from family records that Mr. Kazazian did escape the Armenian genocide a few years later, and he made his way to Toledo, Ohio, where he arrived in 1923. Hodgkick spent the next three years of, the, of World War I um, in Aleppo working as a member of the Epidemics Commission. In 1918, the Ottoman state lost World War I and was quickly broken up into a variety of smaller states, including modern day Turkey. 
Patrick sent for his mother and we believe his older sister that we don't have record of Esther coming to Aleppo and boat and mom was able to come and live with Patrick for the rest of her life in Aleppo. Um, Patrick began the very slow process of rebuilding his life in 1918. He was a founding member of the Virgin Gulbenkian Maternity Hospital, which was the first hospital in Aleppo to treat Christian and Muslim women side by side. This was really his work to end religious segregation and make it so that the Armenian genocide and violence like this against religious minorities would not happen again. The Gulbenki Maternity Hospital was still working um, in 2014 when the Syrian civil war started, uh, but they did close and become a home for Armenian seniors in 2014. In 2016, the Gulbenkian board came together and decided to reopen as a maternity hospital. So today the Gulbenki Maternity Hospital is still open and still treats Christian and Muslim women and other religious minority women side by side. Hatchik was also a founder of the Bogosi Gulbenkian School. Um, and this was really, he saw that he could build up the Armenian diaspora in Syria and the rest of the world by, through education, right? So he's a founding member of the Gulbenkian School, and he's also a founding member of the Armenian Democratic Liberal Party, which continues to serve the Armenian diaspora today. He was the Syrian leader of the Armenian Democratic Liberal Party until his death. Patrick was also the founding editor of Yiprad, which was a daily Armenian newspaper in Aleppo. And his son, Kevin, uh, his son Edward, carried on this um, tradition of keeping the Armenian diaspora up to date with news around the world when he founded the Armenian Reporter in the 1960s here in the United States. The Armenian Reporter was led by Edward Bogosian and then passed on to his daughter, Silver Bogosian Baker, um, Hatchik's granddaughter, who, and she served as senior editor until the mid 2000s. Um, the Armenian Reporter actually stopped, published its last, ish, its last issue in 2014. However, it was a driving force between building up the Armenian diaspora in the generations after the Armenian genocide survivors. On a personal note, Hatchig did marry um, in, in his later life. He was 45 when he got married um, and he married a local Armenian woman living in Aleppo. Her name is Ashtig and you can see her in the photo um, sitting behind Hatchig. In this photo, you'll see Mrs. Bogosian, Hatchig's mother, um, sitting across from him in the far left of the photograph, as well as Hatchig and Ashtig's four children, um, including Edward Bogosian. I want to say thank you to everyone who came to this program today, um, and especially to Silva Bogosian Baker and the entire Bogosian family. It was only through your um, willingness to work with us and preserve your grandfather's history that we were able to tell this history today. I'd also like to thank Dr. Nellie Segal and Adrian McCumber Esquire for their work editing 100 Year Legacy of Courage, which is the smaller book um, on this slide. 100 Year Legacy of Courage was published in 2015 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, and it includes 54 Armenian Genocide survivor accounts written either by the survivors or their descendants. Also on this screen, you'll see the Armenian publication of Dr. Hatrik Bogosian's memoir, um, which was published in 2006. It was published in the old Armenian that Hatrik used to write in and has not yet been translated, but Change does hope to have it translated in the near future. I would like to personally thank Ali Evans, Change's administrative and exhibit coordinator, and Dr. Sarah E. Brown, our executive director, for all of their help in putting together the scrapbook that will accompany your follow-up email. I'd like to thank Karen Finkelstein, our ma manager of technology, for her work in making sure that all of these virtual lunch and learns are successful. Um, and I'd also like to thank our special projects co-directors, Dale Daniels and Susan Yellen, for their work on 100 Year Legacy of Courage and on our exhibit, Journeys Beyond Genocide, The Human Experience, which shares the testimony of um, local survivors from the Holocaust, the Armenian Genocide, and the 1994 Genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. A follow-up email will be sent later this week, hopefully with a beta version of Dr. Hatchik Bogosian's scrapbook, um, which we've compiled using his memoirs and historical data in order to make sure that we can tell the narrative of his life and really share what it meant to be a survivor of the Armenian Genocide. 
I do encourage all of you to join us next week. Um, we have two commemorations taking place. Next Thursday, April 23rd at 7 p.m., we'll be commemorating our Armenian Genocide Remembrance. Um, and this will include a screening of The Stateless Diplomat, which is a film showing the life of Diana Apgar, who was an Armenian woman living in Japan that worked with the Japanese government in order to bring Armenian refugees to Japan. Many of these refugees then moved on to California, and that is one of the reasons we have such a large Armenian diaspora community in California today. Um, this will take place at 7 p.m. Eastern Digital Time. I apologize, this is Eastern Standard Time there. Um, so 7 p.m. Eastern Digital Time on Facebook Live. Um, and you can learn more about that at facebook.com backslash change.bcc. We will also have a Yom HaShoah commemoration on April 21st, that's next Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Digital Time, featuring local Holocaust survivor testimony and a candle lighting vigil. Finally, our fourth installation of the Virtual Lunch and Learn, Queer ABCs, will take place on April 22nd at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Digital Time, and that will focus on learning more about gender and sexuality identities um, in preparation for National Day of Silence, which will take place on April 24th. You can learn more about all of these programs and any other upcoming programs at our website, www.change.org. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the screen share now and we'll open up the chat for questions. Oh, there's a long one. Okay. Um, so this question says, um, oh, so we have another descendant on the line. Um, his grandfather was Krieger Kaltukian, who survived um, the genocide and was also from Kayseri. I don't know if we have anything. Oh, we would, I, we would of course love to add any additional survivors um, information to our collection of Armenian genocide narratives. So if you have testimony, um, if you have memoirs, please get in contact with Change staff. You can reach us at contact, C-O-N-T-A-C-T, -T, uh, at change.org, that's change with two H's. And we'd be happy to uh, set up a meeting with you and our executive director to further discuss any sort of donations that you want to make to Change. I do wanna point out that Change is the only genocide and Holocaust, archi Holocaust archives in the state of New Jersey, and we have over 1,000 objects in our archives, and we're always looking to expand. So thank you for that question. Um, any other questions? Oh, new message. Um, oh, I do want to point out that we do have, I did mention that we have um, many of the grandchildren of Hatchik Vigozian on the line, but we are very lucky today to have his 90-year-old daughter, Femi, on the line, and she's joining us from California. So thank you so much for joining us, Femi. I'm really looking forward to your feedback. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, I do just want to add that we're hoping to put out a scrapbook about Dr. Bogosian's life, and we do want you guys to beta test it. I'm not totally sure on the timeline for that yet, but we're hoping by the end of the week, if not next week. Um, please consider joining us at our commemorations next week. And I'm also hosting Queer ABC, so if you enjoyed this program, hopefully you'll like the next one as well. Um, oh, we do have another question. Um, were the Kurds, along with the Turkish government, persecuting the Armenians? Yes, it wasn't um, state sanctioned. There wasn't state sanctioned violence. So a state sanctioned violence means that the government is deciding that violence should be perpetrated against a group of people. But there was heavy tension between the Kurds and the Armenians. Um, this started out as land disputes and it kind of grew into this discrimination, um, prejudicial discrimination based on the Armenian people. So a lot of the violence perpetrated against the Armenians was by the Kurdish people, uh, especially during the Adana massacres and the early Sassoon massacres of 1893. Um, how many people were on the Armenian march and how many were killed? So we know that about 826 people were on the march um, from Angora, according to Hachik Bogosian's memoirs. Um, and he found out later that these people were being marched to Derzor, which was a desert in the middle of Syria in which over 200,000 Armenians had been killed throughout the genocide 
We don't know the percentage of people who have been murdered um, from his group of 826 from Angora, and that's because he escaped, luckily, after 43 days. Um, and so we don't have numbers, but we do know that 225 at least had died during the march, um, 25 from brute force from the Turks, and then the other 200 um, through starvation or disease. Um, an important question is, were the Armenians persecuted because of their nationalism or their religion or both? Um, the Young Turks movement, so the 1909 rebellion, was really based on this idea that everyone could live together, that regardless of ethnicity or religion, we were going to find peace within the Ottoman Empire. Unfortunately, after the Ottoman state lost both Balkan Wars, the Ottoman, the Young Turks basically tucked tail and ran in the opposite direction. Um, and they decided that Turkey was going to be for the Turks. So Turkey for the Turks was one of their slogans. And that meant that you had to be of Turkish descent. So it kind of ostracized the Kurds as well. And it also meant that you had to be Muslim. And the Armenians were neither Turkish nor Muslim. So um, it was primarily a genocide rooted in that ethnic and religious difference. The nationalism of the Turks was used, I'm sorry, the nationalism of the Armenians was used as a way to justify the violence against the community. Um, but again, the nationalist groups were small um, and they were not able to really create any strong rebellions. They weren't really backed by Russia the way that other nationalist movements were. Um, and so the violence was completely out of proportion to what the Armenian nationalists were creating. Um, and I do have a note here saying that the Kurds were promised Armenian homes and properly, property if they assisted in the genocide. We do know that that is true. Um, we have notes from the various pashas offering Armenian homes to Kurdish warlords. So that is an important point to point out. The state, the government, although at first it was just um, the Kurds perpetrating violence because they disliked the Armenians, by the mid 1890s, the government was backing this violence um, per perpetrated by the Kurds. So you had the government um, giving them weapons and promising them Armenian land if they were able to solve the Armenian problem as they, the Armenian question as they called their relationship with Armenia. Any other questions? Oh. So we have a question here. We don't hear enough about the link between the German support of Turks in World War I and the genocide of the Armenians and the follow on against the Jews in World War II. Um, I would point out that in our exhibit, we focus on a whole section on Armin T. Wagner, who was a German soldier serving in World War I, and he was stationed in the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Ottoman state. And while he was in the Ottoman state, he took photographs of um, the, the genocide taking place, primarily the death marches, with a special focus on women and children, um, because I think he knew that that would get his point across the best. He actually was told by his commanding officers that he could not share these photographs, but he smuggled them out and got them to global newspapers to start sharing with the world the atrocities being committed. Um, Armin T. Wegner served in World War I. He survived. Oh, and okay. Um, so he was born, he, I'm sorry, he served in World War I. He survived World War I. He went back to Germany. And then when Hitler took control in the 1930s, he actually wrote to Hitler and said, I've seen this before. I know what the Turks did to the Armenians. You're going to do the same thing to the Jews. This isn't right. And Hitler actually had Armin T. Wegner put in concentration camps and Wegner spent the entirety of the war imprisoned. Um, the exact date of Dr. Bogosian's birth is September 15th, 1875. I know that was a question as well. Um, but yeah, I think that there, there definitely is a, a recognition of the fact, even within Germany, that they knew what was going on and they did nothing to stop the persecution of the Christians. So, any other questions? Right, so that is important. Um, one of our local Armenian descendants, John Hatayan, has pointed out that Turkey still does not recognize the Armenian genocide um, very, there's very few countries in the world who do. Um, the United States is working towards recognition and 
we hope to have that recognition soon. New Jersey does recognize the Armenian genocide we have since the 1970s. Um, but this denial of the genocide, especially by the Turkish state, is very painful to the Armenian community. And they do lobby frequently to have more countries recognize the genocide and put pressure upon the Turkish government to recognize the atrocities that have been committed against the Armenian people in the early 1900s. Um, we do not know what happened to his sisters. I'm hoping that there's something in the memoir once it's translated that we can uh, get into. Um, and also, if anyone from the family knows anything, please let us know, because I would love to know what happened to the one surviving sister who didn't die of cancer while she was living in Germany. So. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Um, I do want to thank everyone again for joining us, especially members of the Bogosian family. I'm very excited for your feedback, um, and hopefully you'll all join us at our commemorations next week. Um, and also at our fourth installation of our Lunch and Learn Queer ABCs next Wednesday. Thank you so much and have a safe and healthy afternoon. <laughs>